Hey, from New Jersey, it's the SNL Nerds, the show where two comics from New Jersey nerd out about Saturday Night Live. I'm your co-host, Darren Patterson. And I'm your co-host, John Trumbull. Hey, John Trumbull, how are you, sir? I'm doing all right, Darren. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. Okay, witty banter, uh, opening banter over. Whew, yeah. that took a lot out of me. <laughs> it really yeah. did. I'm, I'm, you can't see it, I'm breaking out into the hives over here. Yeah. Was, I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Yeah, but we don't we don't have a ton of time for Witty Banner because we we've got a guest in the house. Ooh, that's right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's our, it's our it's our great friend, good friend, our comedian friend, the man who's been with us. <laughs> I like how you immediately downgraded. I was I was just gonna say that I got I got trashed. <laughs> our great friend. No, wait, that's overstating it. Our good friend. <laughs> Give it up for our acquaintance, Mr. Kevin Israel, ladies and gentlemen. Some guy off the streets. <laughs> he responded to our email. So we All right. The only person who cares enough about Ghostbusters to bring on. <laughs> uh, that's right. Yeah, you, you probably remember Kevin from our previous episodes about the Ghostbusters franchise. And since there's a new Ghostbusters movie out in the theaters uh, still, it's been out since like uh, sometime late March, I think. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, we, we decided to have Kevin back on to uh, complete the, uh, what is it now, like a, a quadrilogy, something like that? Qua- yeah, quadrigi, quadrigi, I guess yeah. they call it. Uh, but yeah, Ghostbusters Empire, we're, Frozen Empire, we're talking about it, came out uh, not too long ago, March 22nd of this mm-hmm. year, had a budget of 100 mil, already grossed 140 yeah, it's, it's doing about as well as the last one, uh, as about as well as uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so Kev, how's it going, man? Thanks for com- Thanks for joining us. It's great. Thanks for having me back. You know, I love this topic, and uh, and I was excited to get the invite. Um, everything's good. I'm actually you. I I haven't had the chance to talk to anybody really about this movie, so I'm ex- I'm excited for this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, this movie came out. Um, this uh, came out a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it's made that big a splash. I don't see too many people talking about it on the uh, on the interwebs. It was very. It was quiet. It seemed like a quiet rollout. They did do with was uh, Liberty Mutual. I think had some tie in. Though I've seen the commercials that had something to do with Ghostbusters, but hmm. there wasn't like a big. You know, I don't. I don't remember seeing any of the stars um on the talk shows or you know that none of them hosted snl to your to your i've, I've your seen expertise. them make a few late night appearances i think they were on uh jimmy fallon show if yeah. i remember correctly okay. of course of course fallon fawned over them it's like oh yeah. my god ghostbusters that's totally great Best movie ever yeah yeah <laughs> and really- i i did i did watch like a morning show clip uh of them i think they were it was either on today or maybe it was a good morning america uh it was a little while ago since i watched it so but, well, yeah. if it was the entire cast, they must have had seven rooms for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was the. Let's see, it was uh, Paul Rudd and McKenna Grace, and they were appearing with the original Ghostbusters, and Annie Potts was there too. Uh, so it was a pretty, uh, a pretty full showing. Yeah, and now Kevin, I. I seem to recall you recently, I think in the lead up to this movie, you rewatched Ghostbusters Afterlife for like the first time since it was out. And I think I did. you revised your opinion of it a little I did. bit, as I recall. Yeah, mm. you know what? I, I definitely think it's one of those movies that I don't want to say it ages well, but I think it 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 it, it ages better. I mean, it definitely I, I I left the movie theater with, you know, not feeling great about it. And when rewatch, you have to and I don't, I don't want to get into the, the 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 Frozen Empire movie, but I think I think with the, what they're doing with the the franchise now, you kind of have to remove yourself from the original movie a little yeah. bit uh-huh. and say this is something different, and I need to look at it through that lens and not through the lens of '84. Because if you do that, you're going to feel the way that I did when I walked out of Afterlife. And mm-hmm. so on rewatch, I just kind of put it. It just happened to be on cable, whatever channel, and. I said, oh, you know what? I, it, had, it had just started, and I said, I, you know, it's just I, I just got caught into watching it, and I ended. I think I watched the entire thing, and I, en- I enjoyed it. I didn't love it, and mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't think that. Oh man, I was so wrong. But it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. They did a good job introducing the characters. That you know, the movie moves at a pretty good pace. Um, the 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 third act gets a little stale and 
you know, fan servicey. Uh, and there were definitely, I definitely some of the uh, the plot weaknesses that I discussed last time. I think still hold up, but it it it, it was better for me, and it it felt it it felt less bad. I guess. I would say. <laughs> yeah, because you were you were. I haven't listened back to our, the episode we did on Afterlife, but you were pretty down on it. I was. I, I I gave it a fairly positive review, as I recall. I I enjoyed it more than I didn't, and I mean, how did how did you guys feel about this one in general? Um, I will, I'll, let's let our guests go first. Uh, Kevin, what are, what are your thoughts on it? <laughs> it I, was, I have I have some thoughts. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. <laughs> okay, it was a mess of a movie, and everything that I thought that it redeemed itself for that afterlife redeemed itself on second watch. They ruined in this movie. Mm. It was just a mess of a story. It was too many, way too many characters. I, uh, I agree with you. And, there. and then they, characters. and not only did they have the whole slew of characters from the last movie, they introduced more characters who I don't know if you were supposed to care about or not. I was hoping they were like the red suits from star Trek that were just going to get killed. Uh-huh. Um, but they didn't. And it was it was just a mess of a movie. And the problem with all of these with with these movies, um, I think, since the first one is that they don't focus enough on the antagonist Mm. and there's not enough build up about the antagonist. In the first movie, the build up to Gozer is a big deal. And, you know, you know, Zool is terrifying and you get that whole feeling of of the, the ominous feeling in the the build up and and then when gozer comes that scene on the top of the building is generally is genuinely and it still holds up is a creepy scene mm-hmm. when this voice comes out of nowhere and says you get to choose how you're going to die like that's a creepy idea and it's and it's done really well in this movie it was just like yeah there's an ice guy and he's coming to get you and oh here he is and it was just it just felt so lazy and so messy. The whole movie was just sloppy. Um, I would I would agree with most of that. Like I I didn't hate it as much as you did, but I definitely felt the movie was kind of more. Eh, it was it, it kind of it was kind of I don't know, kind of bland a little bit. Like um, I will admit like uh the the big bad in this really wasn't built up. In a way, it should have like it should be like this really big threat. It it didn't really kind of feel that way, and I, I don't know. Like also, I kind of felt like a lot of the uh, the OG characters from the movie they still haven't like really fleshed out those characters quite yeah. a lo- quite a bit. Like you know, like Winston and and Janine, they just kind of they just seem to be just kind of there, just to give exposition. And like I I, I kind of I want to kind of care about those characters more. Like you care about them because of the nostalgia factor but like that's kind of it like i i want them to be more fleshed out as characters i guess um but yeah i don't, I don't know uh trumbull what were your thoughts um I, I was okay on it overall i i liked it but i i do recognize it has problems um but like when i walked out of the theater i didn't really feel like i wasted my money i i enjoyed it for the most part um, I, I certainly agree. It has way too many characters. I don't. I don't really think we needed to bring back everybody from Ghostbusters Afterlife. Cause, yeah, yeah. Because that... the, the movie the movie starts out, and we we've, we've got um, Carrie Coon as as Egon's daughter, and McKenna Grace as his granddaughter, and w- we find out that you know she and Paul Rudd's character and uh, Finn Wolfhard's character they've all moved into the city. Uh, and they are going into business as Ghostbusters themselves. Yeah, and well, and and so we have all those four back, and then of course we have the original Ghostbusters back, um, and then you know we also have podcast back. We also have uh, <laughs> what's her face who was like Finn Wolfhard's little uh, love interest from the uh, the uh, restaurant that they worked at. Uh, lucky, lucky. Yeah, and I I don't know if we needed everybody back. You know, who, who, who've just, they've now moved from Oklahoma to New York City. Yeah. That I was mean, a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the, because like the fact that they kind of explain why podcast was there, because podcast and Lucky, they were there for the summer. Like right. Lucky was there for an internship with Winston. I was like, all right, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Podcast was there for the summer. 
hanging out with Ray, but he told his parents something else. He was at space right. camp. I was like, okay, I can buy that. I don't know. The fact that uh, Egon's descendants and Gary just all picked up and moved to New York City, that kind of... I, that was a little bit hard for me to believe, I guess. I, it was. I think it was weird in the regard that, like, because as I recall, a big thing in Afterlife was they moved out to Oklahoma was because they couldn't afford to stay right, right. where they were. So, like, suddenly, I don't know, I guess Ghostbusting is a stable enough business model that you can now <laughs> afford to live in Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming maybe maybe Winston's picking up the check. I for guess the he is, yeah. he Because Winston has become kind of a, a mogul. Um, yeah. And Which like also between... just out of it, it feels like the these the plots of these movies or the screenplays, there were like five people in separate rooms all writing stuff, and then they handed it to one guy and said, Now put this all together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he did so without ever trying to like explain anything. Because like there's there's interesting things that they could have explored. Like, how did Winston get so rich? They talk about it very briefly, but they give it short shrift, and that's it. And mm-hmm. so now he's got this company. And he's or whatever he did, and he's very wealthy. And now he's just going to be the financial backer of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, and you just right. just just take it, just take it because we said so. Okay. Yeah. And then they they go and they move into the 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 firehouse. Fire, the firehouse. And at some point in this last movie, they said something about how this firehouse is a central location for something. They give it some supernatural feeling that for some reason this has to this is the place where things have to happen but then they never explain that they never go into that again that's just that's why we're here okay and and again audience just take it because we said so Mm -hmm. and then and then it's just throwing all these things at you like one of the things that really bothered me that felt just so weak was that okay so the ghostbusters the team we know is the new or the new ghostbusters are are working out of the fire station. But then meanwhile, Winston has this like secret lab where they're developing on this stuff. Why would he have kept that a secret from them? What purpose did that secret serve? Uh, if he was, if he was coming up with better stuff for them to you, like why wouldn't they have been wrapped into that? That mm-hmm. makes absolutely no sense. It was a secret for no reason other than to be like, see audience, there's stuff going on behind the scenes and we're just supposed to go, Ooh, and not go, well, why? And mm-hmm. it, it just it felt just it was just a stupid plot point that could have been it would have been made much more interesting if 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 Winston had said, all right, I'm a businessman now. I'm going to run Ghostbusters like a business. And now there aren't just four Ghostbusters. Now we have an entire you know, franchise of Ghostbusters and there are Ghostbusters mm-hmm. throughout the country. And we have a laboratory where we're developing. And you guys, Paul Rudd and crew are the New York franchise of the Ghostbusters and but you're going to be you here's all the franchise stuff you have to do like it would have that would have felt a little more interesting like ghostbusters as a like a national business as opposed to like there's still the little ghostbusters where a firehouse but then there's this other thing like it just it just felt like they didn't spend any time to think of what's the next logical step for this what's the next interesting aspect we could explore about this enterprise mm mm-hmm. mhm yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, because they are still the only Ghostbusters, like literally in the world in right. this in this universe. Like, they, you don't hear of any other uh, branches or in, of outside the of this one, <laughs> this one little right. firehouse. And there's no the ghosts guys. anywhere else. Yeah, that, that makes sense. No, no, they're all in New York. Yeah, they're all in New exactly. York City. Exactly. Yeah, I um, I don't. I I really liked the opening scene. I like how the it started with the new Ghostbusters just, you know, driving around town on the Ecto-1. And, um, you know, we're seeing them um, going after ghosts. And um, they, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought because uh, people just came home and we have have dogs going. <laughs> I, I was like, no, that's dog sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me, let me backtrack uh, on my tr- my train of thought a little bit. Um, I, I really like the opening scene where we're seeing, um, you know, Paul Rudd and Carrie Coon and, and the new Ghostbusters. They're running around in the Ecto-1 and they're going after ghosts. And we're seeing some of the new equipment, I think most of which was established in the last movie, but I still think of it as new equipment. And we see how like their techniques have kind of evolved you know, we've we've got the jump seat coming out of the Act One. We've yeah. got the them releasing a, a ghost trap in a drone. 
which I thought was really cool. I was like, oh, that's a neat idea. And that's, you know, kind of bringing the Ghostbusters into the 21st century a little bit. And, you know, they had the the other trap on on wheels on like a little scooter thing that, that we're releasing from the bottom of the Ecto-1. And I thought that was really neat. And then as the movie went on, I it began to meander a bit and it was going in a lot of different directions. Yeah. And, and, and about halfway through the movie, you know, like, you know, at the beginning I was like, Oh, I'm really enjoying this. This is, this is a good Ghostbusters movie. And then uh, by about halfway through, I was like, I, I feel like we've lost the thread a little bit. Right. And yeah. right. I mean, and I, I wasn't disliking the movie. It, it has its moments throughout. I mean, there's stuff I like, but it is going off in a lot of different directions. Like, you know, we, we see like Finn Wolfhard, like his one subplot is basically, He's trying to capture Slimer in, yeah, yeah, in the he, firehouse, and yeah. I don't know what that what purpose that None. served, other than to give None. Finn Wolfhard stuff to do and to yeah. give and to say, "Hey, there's Slimer. Remember him?" Yeah, like I really felt like uh, Finn Wolfhard scene. Like th- those are basically just stuff just for the trailer. Like he really mm-hmm. doesn't have much. Like because like in the, even in the afterlife, his whole thing was he was a driver. He was like the hot rod head that loved to right. drive around the ecto. He, and this one, he didn't. He doesn't even get to do that. I, he gets to drive it like at the end, and it's right. like, yeah, and, and, and it's like a big deal because I think he's just officially gotten his license, or yeah. no, no, he's he's arguing like, oh no, I'm 18 now, I'm a man, and right. and you know um, what? And by the way, he, if he's if he's a hot rod head, like it's okay. We've we we had Ghostbusters Afterlife, which was serves as the transition from the old to the new guard. Mm-hmm. So it's and it's okay now if we have some new stuff like. The idea of them driving around still in this old beat up Ecto One, which, by the way, is one of my favorite hero cars mm-hmm. in movie history, and I think anybody would probably agree with that. But it's okay; like they could have a new car now. They could have a badass SUV or something. Like Batman upgraded the Batmobile as the years went on. <laughs> yeah, they can have true. a they can have a new car. And Winston is this multi millionaire, and he hasn't bought them a new like come on get you know a a dodge charger that's all souped up or something like something cool like like to give us a feel that like okay this is ghostbusters but it's it's moving on it's moving on from where it was and this is the new this is a new feel and the other the other thing i noticed about the movie that uh, i i forgot to say earlier when i was in the theater my wife and i went to see it and there were a lot of kids in the movie theater like a lot Mm -hmm. of little kids like seven eight year olds and I my sister took me to see it in 1984, and I remember her as we sat down going, "Oh, you're the only kid in the movie theater." <laughs> and oh. now I think eight, Ghost, the original Ghostbusters I think was PG or was it PG 13? I think it was. PG. I believe it was PG. I don't think PG 13 quite existed. Yeah, it's a, you're right. I don't think it did. Um, but it it look and I and I've I've said this dozens of times whenever I talk about the original Ghostbusters. It had especially at the time a horror sci-fi aspect to it that had that it really did have that feeling it had a few a few good jump scares it had a very eerie feeling about the movie and it did a very good job of incorporating the comedy into into that mm-hmm. while the scene where uh the scene with the with the devil dog in the uh in the in the party and then tracking down Lewis Tully at Tavern on the Green, like that's a creepy scene. Like you know, he gets at the time you think maybe and, he got and it ends on a big laugh too, right? Yeah, right. And and so there's there's a and these these movies these newer movies have none of that. They have nothing that at, at any point felt ominous or dangerous. And these are now family movies. And that's my that was my greater point that I was trying to get to. Uh, there were kids in the movie theater, and I, you know I think a lot of parents who were probably my age it just didn't wait as long as I did to have kids, uh, who have kids who are you know eight to twelve or whatever, are saying, "Oh, I'll take them to to see this." And the producers of that movie know that of these movies, and they said, mm-hmm. "Okay, well, we need to make a more fr- family friendly franchise," and that's what they did. It's very watered down. It's I would I would not call it adult comedy it's definitely got no adult comedy to it like in the original peter vankman's entire motivation in that movie was to bang sigourney weaver Mm -hmm. like that was i mean he never came out right and said that but we all knew it like that's what yeah he was he was a dog he was he was trying to bang the co-ed that was you know he was testing on in the in in the beginning of the movie like that was he was a he was a dog and Mm -hmm. that was something that that was a 
and it, it rode throughout the whole movie. And they could never do that in a movie today with this or this, at least the franchise they're making it now. These are very family friendly movies and that's fine, but you have to go into it knowing that. But also, if you're going to do that and you're going to lean all the way into it, you should you should still give us a, a coherent plot and something that we can sink our teeth into a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. That totally tracks. Like, I feel like it. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. I agree with you. Like the the plots kind of seem to go all over the place because, like, like we said, we had the thing with Trevor trying. Like his only reason to be in this movie was to chase uh, Slimer, and then we have Phoebe's kind of subplot where she kind of makes friends with this uh, yeah. ghost uh, Melody in in the park when they're playing chess, and this, we find out like Melody was this uh, girl around her age who kind of died in a stray fire, and then they sort of strike up a friendship that. Maybe like the, it seemed like they hint in the movie it was kind of like almost romantic too. I it was it, there was definitely that subtext, and oh, honestly, 100%. I wish they'd been gutsy enough to go a little further I with it. And, totally you know, have, agree with you. Have them, I, you know, have it. I, I'm like, you know, it's 2024. Why are we playing this as subtext? If you if you want to make the Phoebe character gay, make her gay, right? And just and just you know have them even just exchanging a kiss or something like what yep. I, I just didn't see the point in being ambiguous about it. It was, yeah. you know what? And it's, it almost, it almost stood out to me more in that mm-hmm. they didn't go all the way with it because yeah. it was, it was almost like, why are you making me do this work? Like, <laughs> yeah. why you, like, yeah, that's a good make, way to put it. Don't make we me. We shouldn't have to gay. fill in the blanks anymore. Yeah, you know? like, right. If a character's gay, they're gay. Like, don't make me sit and be like, "Is she gay? Am I supposed to feel bad because I think she might be gay? Like, is that are you making me a bad person? Because, like, no, <laughs> just make her gay. Like, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't think of anything that was in the first movie that would preclude her being gay. Or anything like that, and yeah. I, I will say, like McKenna Grace is still one of the highlights of these new Ghostbuster movies. She is wonderful. Uh, she is she's a great actress. Uh, I totally buy her as Egon's granddaughter, and you know I, I love how they've made her up because, like, when I see her on the talk shows, she looks very different. Yeah, because <laughs> um, she doesn't wear glasses. She's blonde in real life, and I'm like, that's the same actress, but she's she's just wonderful. I can't say enough good things about McKenna Grace, man. Yeah, I would have loved if the movie either focused in on more or was an entire was entirely just a her and race dance movie. Mm-hmm. I thought I thought the two of them had fun chemistry together. They did. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I thought that was a really that could have been a really interesting way to go. Like she's learning to be a Ghostbuster, and Ray takes her under her wing, his wing, and starts sh- like showing him the way, and like whatever. Like that would have like a buddy cop almost type of movie. Like that would have been mm-hmm. fun. But they gave us like a little little bits of it, and it stood out. It's funny when Darren brought up the uh, the Ghost Girl, whose name I don't even remember, Melody. Uh, Melody. I completely forgot about that already. <laughs> I totally forgot about Cause, that. Because there's so line. many different subplots in this yeah. movie and they don't really converge until the end. And and not in like a Swiss watch sort of way and just a sort of meandering like, how are these connected sort of way? Right, right. Um, and, you know, the other I, I would say if I had a big disappointment <laughs> with the film, it wasn't quite as funny as I wanted it to be. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't make me laugh too, too much. Um the 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 first time in the movie I laughed aloud was when they're touring uh, Winston's new facility, uh, and they're analyzing various ghost ghostly uh, uh, apparatus, uh, and, and he makes a comment about like a possessed spin doctor's CD. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's funny. That made me laugh as a Gen Xer. So yeah. I was like, ha. Ah! Um, yeah, that that just it tickled me. Um, and then there was a bit towards the end when we're having our big showdown in the firehouse. And, you know, we have Kumail Nagiani's character, who's a, a pyrotechnic guy. Uh, fire, and, firefighter, not firefighter. <laughs> uh, Forgot about he, him. He like too. generates fire um, <laughs> or controls flames, I guess. And and, and like the, he needs a light because like his the the lighter fluid has run out on the light lighter he was using and they're like does anybody have a cigarette lighter and then ray says oh i quit in the 90s and then bill murray just goes proud of you then 
proud of you now. And, and, and it's in the middle of the final firefight. And and Bill Murray just like wonderfully throws that away. Uh, that amused me. Those, those I think, were the two biggest gags in the movie. And other than that, I, it didn't, there weren't too many gag gags that made me laugh, you know? Yeah, I will admit that. Like, I would, I did think there'd be more funny parts because it has a few funny people. I mean, like you said, it had Kumail in it and it had uh, Patton Oswald in it. But even mm-hmm. like his scene was okay, but it wasn't like, I don't know, I, I thought he would have. Uh, Patton had to was... deliver a whole gob of exposition, and that was mainly what they had him do. Yep. So much exposition. Yep. Which which seems like a bit of a waste of Patton Oswald. Yeah. Um, which, and you, you know just, what? You, you, I'm sorry, John. Oh, you, I'm, I'm sorry. I had another random thought, so you go ahead, because you're probably going to continue the current thought. You brought up two great points that I that were also problems for me. First mm-hmm. of all, I forgot about Kamal being in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, uh, that he felt so shoehorned into this movie mm-hmm. that they they looked at the cast and they were like, we need somebody who's got some real comedy credentials. And who's fu- who's a funny guy? Kamal. And he's just going to be a stereotypical Indian guy who's got the accent and has some history dating back to some time somewhere. And mm-hmm. we're just going to have him do some funny stuff. And it felt like such an afterthought. It felt like he was really tagged on after the movie was 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 made. Mm-hmm. And he just didn't work in the movie. It He didn't have any chemistry with any of the cast. He was introduced. It was such a clunky introduction that he like, oh, I have this, I have the thing, you know, I have the thing that we're all, the, all, the, the MacGuffin that we're all going to be worried about. It, it, he was, I thought, really, really thought he was bad and, and not, not come on, it's not his fault. I'm sure he mm-hmm. got paid very nicely and walked away happy, but the character was written very poorly. The, that plot point was a mess. He was suddenly, you know, now suddenly there's Avengers in the Ghostbusters and it's, it, it, <laughs> That that was that was a that was a weak point for me. Mm-hmm. Also, a weak point for me was, and I hate to say this, and I it hurts to say this, was Bill Murray. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he felt like they went, they literally were tape filming, and they were like, "Hey, go knock on Bill's door and see if he'll do this scene." Yeah. And they went and got him, and he had sunglasses on, and he was like, "I'm not taking these off." <laughs> and they're like, "But it's night, and it's dark, and you're about to get." And he's like, "No, I'm gonna. It's cool. I'm I'm keeping them on." He mailed his appearance in this movie so bad, and they and they clearly knew that he was going to because he barely was written into the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that he just, had the least to do of the of the three original Ghostbusters that we right, had in the movie, right? Yeah, and they and they tried giving him that one scene where he was you know with him and Kamal and like give that it almost it almost was that like the old com- a comedy guard passing the torch to the new no no pun intended passing mm-hmm. the torch to the new comedy guard. It just didn't. It just didn't work. It felt like the, like the scene in Caddyshack where it was Bill Murray and Chevy Chase, and it, like that iconic scene Ooh. where the two of them came together for the one scene they taped together. It, it it almost felt like it was like a like a wink and a nod to that. Like, look at these two comedy guys. This is going to be funny, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it just it I, yeah. It just feels like everything they tried to do this movie was poorly done. And the only thing I can compare it to, and it's not going to make any sense when I first say it, is the Eternals. Mm. because they tried to jam so much stuff into this movie that would have been, it would have been better as a TV show. And I, I've been saying that since I've seen, I saw the internals in the theater. Yeah. Yeah. And the Eternals, 1 billion percent should have been a TV show. Yeah. I'm sure at some point somebody said that on the set or when writing the script and they just said, no, we don't have time to, to do that or whatever. But this, but it feels like now Ghostbusters, do you guys remember the show from the, I don't remember if it was the late eighties or early nineties. The Friday the thirteenth show. The uh, syndicated one? Yeah. Uh, I, it had nothing vaguely, to do with Friday really the thirteenth. It, but... it was a it was a show about it had nothing to do with Jason Voorhees at all. Right. It was just a sh- I don't even know why they called it. it there was like an old scientist or an old library and you had two young people and then there was like mystical spooky stuff going yes, on, right? They, they it was a it was an old guy and I think his grand grandchildren. And he had this store that was full of haunted cursed items they were cursed items and it was their job to go around and collect find more of these cursed items and bring them back to the store because once they were in the store they couldn't hurt anybody and so every episode was about them going out and finding one of these cursed items and it was i i i think i watched the entire show when i was when i was a kid i can't remember how when it was but uh 
it almost feels like that's what Ghostbusters should be now. Give them a show where every episode they go out and they bust a ghost or they do something and you can have different characters featured in different episodes. You know, you can focus on all these different this different cast and and do that. And I have it, you know, you can have an overarching plot because nobody does the, you know, the, the, the standalone episodes anymore. But do that. But these movies are if you're going to continue to try to make these movies this amalgamation of 19 different plots and subplots, it's it's just going to be a mess. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you're talking about the cartoon show, the, the real Ghostbusters. Yeah. And, and, and the, that's why the cartoon show was so great. It every episode was, you know, was really self-contained. They did a very good job of establishing the characters, making them feel a little different than the movie, but enough that you recognize that if you were an adult watching it. And and I think there sometimes were some overriding strings through the episodes that connected some of them together. But this show was they did. I re, I loved I haven't watched that show in a long time, but I loved that show as a kid. Mm. Okay. Yeah, you would have been just the right age. for Yeah, it, it was sure. that was right in my wheelhouse because you it would hit when you were like probably around 12 or something, yep, which is exactly. about the age I was when I saw the original film. Um, you know, one thing I, I kind of wish they'd done is I wish that the uh, original Ghostbusters, I wish they'd given them all more of an entrance, like the way they were each introduced into the film just seemed very pedestrian. Mm. You know, they were like, like after they, they talked to Kamel Nagiani's character, they're like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to bring somebody in for you to talk to. And then just suddenly it's like, just Bill Murray's there. And there's no real, there's no sort of fanfare about it. He doesn't have a funny entrance line or anything. He's just there and he's doing the, the reading, you know, and he's, and, and Kamel's got the Lewis Tully col- colander on his head and they're doing yeah. that <laughs> reading again. So it, it felt like a bit of a rehash scene because it was, it was very close to what, well, you know, things we've seen before. Right. And that, and I'm just yeah. like, you know, okay, well first, why is, why is Bill Murray the one <laughs> administering this? Yeah. This was never his thing. It, I guess it was an Egon thing before, but, but, yeah. you know, I also thought that with Winston and, and uh, Ray, I wish they'd each gotten more of an entrance. Cause like in the last film, it was th- them all showing up was like the grand finale. So they all had a group entrance, but I, I feel like it was a missed opportunity to not give them each a, a, a more memorable entrances, you know? Yeah. It almost feels like, I mean, there were two other um, uh, old school OG, as they say, mm-hmm. uh, people that were mm-hmm. in this movie that I feel like they got bigger entrances. Like one was the, uh, the guy that uh, I won't say ran the library, but the the head of the library yeah. <laughs> from the original movie, yeah, and uh, Mr. Walter Peck, who is now the city mayor. Yes. It seems like they got more of a bigger. We haven't talked about that. How did you, how did you guys like seeing Peck in there again? It's terrible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was expecting more of a reaction. I, I yeah. thought that was a nice twist of bringing him in, and then now he's the mayor of New York City, and he's still got his anti Ghostbusters vendetta. And he basically comes down on them after the first scene, and he's like, "You know, you, Phoebe Spengler, you cannot be a Ghostbuster because you're you're underage." And she's like, "How old is she supposed to be? Like like sixteen uh, now, yeah. something like that? F- Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay." Um, and so that's that kind of sets her arc in motion is that she can't officially be a ghostbuster, but she wants to prove herself as worthy of being a ghostbuster. Um, right. And I, and I thought that was a good arc for her. I, th- I feel like if it's anybody's movie, it's it's Phoebe's movie. I, I felt like they didn't really give Paul Rudd or Carrie Coon much to do at all. Like uh, Paul Rudd kind of has the subplot of like he's he's basically a surrogate father to these kids now. And his struggle is that he's not much of a disciplinarian because he's not their actual father. So he he doesn't feel entirely comfortable with that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna draw another analogy, and that's not gonna make sense when I say it at first. I mean, we expect nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> I I have this very well thought out theory about Stifler in the American Pie movies. Go mm-hmm. on. And if you go if you watch them all in in sequence, which you should never do. Uh, no, I mean you you will hate humanity at the yes, end of that. Mm-hmm. You will see, you'll notice that Stifler evolves in a very strange way. He goes from being kind of a dickhead jock, Mm -hmm. the the character that we all know. We all knew that guy in high school. Uh, And it it was very identifiable. He was just likable enough not to like completely hate him, but he was a, he was just a, a, like a douchey jock. 
Mm-hmm. And that rode through the first two movies. Right. And then suddenly he just becomes a moron. Like, yes, like yes. Mentally he, he got, dis- he got like flanderized mentally the disabled tropes, people say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it is. So, and by American wedding or whatever the one after it was, mm-hmm. he's, he, it's like, Oh, he must've had a stroke or something. And he, <laughs> he's handicapped. Yeah. like he, be, and it's just such a strange. And I always, I, I, like, I know I, I, I still I keep in touch with some of those people, strangely enough, who I did I didn't like in high school, who were those kind of dickhead jocks. And they've and actually almost to a one, they've evolved into sort of better people. Some of mm-hmm. them the one or two stayed, you know, kind of douchey, but they didn't become the R word, which I'm not gonna say, but we all know what I'm saying. Class. Um mm-hmm. they, you know, it's just it was it's just a straight it's it, so that, I'm not trying to get into a, a dissertation on American Pie, but I feel like that's what they did with Paul Rudd. Mission in failed. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they did with Paul Rudd in this movie. He mm. went from by kind of being this like quirky, funny, like cool teacher guy. To, and he's like, like this, a seismologist, as I recall. Yeah, he's he, yeah, yeah, he's a scientist. He was supposed to be very smart. He goes to being this like awkward, overly goofy sort of dad figure. And I get that he's had the struggle of like, what am I in this family? Which is fine. But mm-hmm. his jokes and his personality just became so – they were like, oh, you liked him? You like that stuff? Well, we're going to do it a hundred times more in this one. And, mm-hmm. it's, and it's just like, no, more isn't always better. Right. You don't always have to turn the volume up to 11. No. Like it's okay. And yeah. they did that with him. And I thought he felt – I didn't laugh once at Paul Rudd. Mm. And he's – and Paul Rudd is great. In the in the Marvel movies as comic relief, he does a great job of fitting and and existing with all those very serious characters and those very serious situations and still feeling like, oh, he's the guy who would be cracking jokes. Because I always say I always say, you know, whenever there's movies that take themselves too seriously, I always think like there's nobody who's cracking jokes at this. Like there's always somebody whose nervous response to things is is poor, poorly timed humor like that exists. And, Absolutely. And when movies don't acknowledge that, it sometimes becomes it, it's almost like, OK, somebody would be breaking the tension here. And that's what Paul Rudd feels like, you know, his Ant-Man does in the Marvel. I movie. mean, and, and that was, you know, Bill Murray's basic function as Peter Venkman in the original movies. He always had a quip. Right. hundred percent. And you could tell that it was a defense mechanism for that character. Mm-hmm. And it made sense. And in this movie, in 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 Frozen Empire, Frozen Kingdom, Frozen whatever it was, Frozen called, Empire, you got it right the uh, first time. It he j- it just felt like Paul Rudd was just turned into this like he's a goofy dad now. Look at him; he's so dumb and awkward. He doesn't get anything with these kids. And I was just like, why did you do that? Why did you mm-hmm. have to do that with him? And yeah. again, I think it's just to feed into well, this is a family movie now, so kids are going to be like, oh, dad. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes sense. Like, I think it is a thing where they kind of, they they kind of maybe didn't quite understand why people like his character so much, or why they think they like Paul Rudd so much that they like, oh, they like him because he's goofy, dopey guy. So we'll just turn yeah. that up, and they'll like him more. Like, I kind of saw the same thing. Ha- I mean, I don't know if any of you guys watch Friends back in the day, mm-hmm. but like, I kind of saw them do the same thing to Joey. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Joey yeah. definitely got stupider as that yeah, show went he on. Got, yeah. He got so dumb. He got, well, it's because it's like on, on sitcoms especially, you're always sort of steering into the curve. And I think what happened with Friends was like somebody said in the first season, like, oh, you know, Matt LeBlanc plays dumb really well. And so, you know, and they discovered that over the course of the first season. And then they start writing to that more. And and as you write a dumber, per, a dumb person, you can't help over time, but make them dumber and dumber and dumber. That's just going to happen, especially on a on a long running sitcom like that. So, like, yeah, by the end, it's like, did you get lobotomized between seasons or something? Like, what yeah. happened to you? Yep. <laughs> yeah, no. Absolutely. And it's like and it's also and like the like Batman's voice in the Nolan's movies. Like yeah. each, each, each movie is in voice got gravelier and deeper. And it was, just, and, and, you know, there's always stories all over the place that, well, that's what Nolan was asking for, but regardless, it's noticeable. Right. And why did you have to lean so hard into that? Yeah. I mean, as I recall, like uh, he had a very growly voice in the first film and, and we will get back to Ghostbusters eventually. <laughs> yes. I, I promise you. <laughs> um, but by the second film, it got so exaggerated and gravelly. I remember that first scene where, like he 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 takes down the the sort of self deputized Batman 
in in his opening scene and and one of them goes like what's the difference between me and you and batman says mm. i'm not wearing hockey pads yep that's the line but what christian bale said was like i'm not wearing hockey pads <laughs> and i was like what did he say i have no idea cuz apparently christopher nolan doesn't like uh uh looping his movies Mm, so like uh, whatever crappy sounds he gets on the day, that's just how that movie is sounding now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Pete, he doesn't. Pete Holmes does a great series making fun. Oh yes, yes. like he does the best Batman Nolan Batman impressions yeah. and mocking, and it's just it's and he fantastic. he also utterly nails christian bale's habit of keeping his mouth open like a doofus <laughs> where mouth, like so many breather. scenes he's he just his mouth is just hanging open and i'm just like why do you let him do it it does not look good it just makes him look like a simpleton but anyway i've i've often said this podcast could turn into a batman podcast at the drop of a hat and <laughs> here we are i just proved that again but the, no, the, so. the, i think the point is and i will i will try to rein it back for you john okay i think the, <laughs> i think the point is that oftentimes the directors or writers or whoever makes these decisions see something that works and goes we just need more of that mm-hmm. and 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 for me paul rudd's character really was wasted because he didn't really have a lot of point in the in the movie outside right. of just being the goofy dad and then his comedy you know, presence was just awkward and weird and it never felt like it fit. Like, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. I, and you, we could, you could probably do like a whole analysis of like how comedies have movie comedy movies have evolved over time. And, you know, there's a lot of people who say, well, the comedy movie is dead. Like they, like they don't, they don't make good comedies anymore. They're not, they're not big money makers. There's also the risk of, you know, writing a joke that's going to offend somebody that's going to turn everybody off. So comedies just aren't worth the the risk. But if you look at comedies like back in the eighties, when I, you know, I really think was like the, the late seventies through eighties, it's really the peak of, of comedy movies. The, the jokes that were told in the in the movies a lot of times were also supposed to be jokes between the characters like mm-hmm. they they were funny lines that existed also within the context of the of the dialogue it just it wasn't just like looking at the audience and being like get it it was a joke for it was a it was a dialogue joke it was an exchange like they were the characters would have been laughing too and now it feels like when they write all these jokes it's just jokes that exist for just like this is for you guys watching this isn't happening here this nobody's going to wonder why i said that mm-hmm. and it's and it it comes off it just comes off very and that's why i think like almost like de- and now i'm going to go off on another tangent but that's why like deadpool is so refreshing because he does it and he's doing it out front he's saying the quiet part out loud yeah. he's mm-hmm. doing and he's making the joke and he's going yeah i'm talking to you and you know i'm talking to you because i'm telling you that i'm talking to you and that and that feels almost like oh okay that's that's better, but a lot of times these these movies and it's I think it's on display here and I can't come up with any specific examples because I I saw it once two and a half weeks ago, but <laughs> it, it the the jokes don't land as though they're jokes within the context of the dialogue and between the characters they're just funny stuff that's like this is the audience will like this we're going to do this oh I and can th- think I can think of one uh, they put it in the trailer where. It's like um, Paul Rudd's character and the mom, Callie, are like talking about like maybe getting out of ghost busting because like I think that's where Walter Peck kind of comes down on them like um, mm-hmm. like the dean in Animal House is like oh you I'm, 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 I'm shutting the <laughs> house busters are on double secret probation <laughs> yeah and then uh, and then Paul Rudd's character says no we have to fight for this house you know uh, busting and then he starts saying you know. He's oh. quoting to the theme song. Yeah. Boston makes me feel good. And like, that's something that doesn't quite, I mean, I guess it makes sense. And, and she's like, don't say it, don't say it. And he's, and, yeah. I mean, they. I thought they played that moment about as well as you could. I did think it was very interesting that this movie actually canonized the Ghostbusters music video from yeah. Ray Parker yeah, Jr. At one point, there's, was, we're seeing funny. the original Ghostbusters strutting down New York Street. Right. Uh, down Times Square with Ray Parker. And I was like, oh, that, so that's an in-universe thing now. Yeah, I also liked how they included some uh, com- old commercials from like the Ghostbusters toys and yep. mm-hmm. yeah. the cereal. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. I guess but you know yeah. what? I would have liked to see like that moment where the where we saw the the video, the music video. If mm-hmm. if Ray or Peter was there and, and was like, ugh, I hated having to do that. 
or something like some like, like we never the, got any residuals for that. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. It, was, it was it was all just like fan servicey. Like here, you guys want the old stuff. Here's the old stuff. Take it, <laughs> take it, take mm-hmm. it. We're not even going to try to write something around this. It just it just goes back to this. It was just a really lazy, messy script that I'm sure got hacked up a million times as it went through the process and mm-hmm. probably started off as something different. Um, but it it was just it was just bad for me <laughs> fair enough and i I, yeah. I will agree like i guess another quibble i have about it is like how it seemed very convoluted the whole thing about the um the main ghost and how he came to be and the mm-hmm. the, the um the, me- the adventurer society waking up uh garaka and that whole his b- whole backstory it seemed like a lot like how and then they had they had the chant that um the that the adventure society got to awaken him on this little like microfiche or this uh, cylinder device and then that became a thing they had to like chase that down because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. one of the ghosts escaped from winston and, and they get that through Pat oswald's character as i recall yes yes who's like the head of the library yeah and i don't know like the whole them bringing up another new ghost, uh, Garaka, and his whole backstory—it it, just—I I don't know. It, it, it seemed, it seemed like a little. It was a little. I mean, it seemed like a little tough to follow for me. I don't. I don't know. But was it just? It's that. not even that it's just tough to follow. Which you're right, it is. But it's also that like, why do they keep doing the same formula? Whereas there's this big bad ghost that had worshippers that's trying to come back, and it's and it, like do something different. Would make the Ghostbusters do. There's plenty of ghost stories and ghost movies out there that you could use as as a basis for. Like, why don't they go deal with like a a, a haunted house? Like, there's a house mm-hmm. somewhere. It doesn't have to be the you know a, a global disaster. It could just be there. There's a, a haunted house and somebody's trapped in it and they have to go save somebody from the haunted house. Or there's a an undead axe murderer ter- terrorizing a town and they have to go stop him and, and figure out what's going on. Like, give us just, give us just a smaller, you know, sort of insulated mm. Ghostbuster story I mean, about them solving. I, th- problem. I think there was even an episode of the real Ghostbusters cartoon where they like, they screwed up a Christmas carol somehow. Cause I think they busted Marley's ghost or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I'm like, when I first heard that, I was like, that's a really creative idea. I mean, that's, that's the sort of stuff you should be doing with the Ghostbusters. I mean, there are so many, ghost stories out there and i mean hell just you know pick dan Aykroyd's brain for a half hour and yeah, i'm totally. sure he could come up with like some some real ghost lore that you could base a movie around yeah um but no that, that is a good point kevin like how like the, i didn't even realize until now where yeah it's always like some big ghost who's trying to come back from the dead and take his vengeance out on humanity mm-hmm. and like you know take over the world it's always it's always like a, a world ending life-threatening event Right. It doesn't have to be global stakes. It can just be, right. this is the day in the life of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, that, I mean, that could be fun. Um, but I guess there's the expectation that it has to be a big effects extravaganza and, and you have to have the threat bigger and bigger. And you, you fall into that trap a lot in sequels. Mm. Um, yeah. The, you know, a thing I would like to see, and this is something that like Sigourney Weaver has been proposing for years, is... I would like to see what her kid Oscar is doing these days. Because, <laughs> you know, he's he was a baby in, in Ghostbusters 2. So the kid would be about 35 now. And it's the perfect age for him to, you know, come in and right. be a Ghostbuster himself. Yes. And it, it, it just, I as soon as she first proposed that, I was like, that's the best idea I've ever heard. Is, you know, Oscar's grown up and now he's a Ghostbuster. And I want to see what that kid beca- became. Because presumably he was raised by Dana and Venkman. Yeah. And he's never even mentioned in any of these modern movies. Yeah, why yeah, can't that kid be point. one of the people working at uh, Winston's f- new facility? Yeah, ex- uh, exactly. That'd be- I, I mean, how fun would that be for the the long term fans? Is is you have a grown up Oscar, and you know you cast some current comedy star as Oscar. John, we don't need any more characters. <laughs> I know, I know. I well, I would do that, and I would take out some of the other characters. I don't think we really needed a podcast or Lucky in there. Or... No, or the or uh, his the love interest, the um, Finn Wolfhard's love interest. Uh, Lucky, 
Yeah. Lucky. Oh, the lucky, right? That was, yeah. I forgot that was her. Yeah, she, yeah, she didn't yeah. do anything. In this and thing. she was just, and that was a really sloppy introduction. Like they're just, oh, there she is. Oh, I didn't know you're here. Oh, yeah. I guess it's come on. Everybody yeah, I'm ends working up here in the same city as you, and I, I never bothered to get in touch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of puts Finn Wolfhard in this place. Right. Right. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> message received. Oh, All right. right. Um, it's like that was just summer love, baby. I thought I thought we had something, but. Uh, nah. But it, but hey, it's nice that Carrie Coon and Paul Rudd's characters made a go of it. Um, yeah, I guess I guess yeah, they're in, in it for the long. I guess that was another thing that kind of was like, oh wait, so this guy is just gonna pick up his whole life and move to New York with his girlfriend. I, all look, right, Darren. Once once you've had possessed ghost dog sex, <laughs> the you best know, you, kind. You, you don't go back. That's. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta lock that shit down. Yes. <laughs> Insert doggy style joke here. <laughs> yes. Oh boy. Um, you know, one thing I, this is probably a relatively minor thing, but one thing I really liked was it gave us a really nice sense of the firehouse and how it was laid out. And I love seeing mm. the other floors of the firehouse and, yeah. and getting a better sense of the layout of the entire structure than in any of the other Ghostbusters movies. I mean, we just, before we saw like the, just certain rooms, but we never were like, oh, okay. So the, the, the basement area where the ghost containment unit is, that's right below the reception area. And then, and then, you know, up there we, and then we've got like two more floors that are living areas. And then there's the attic area where Slimer was apparently hanging out. I really like that. They did a really nice job of establishing that layout and fixing it in, in the viewer's heads. Yes. So I, I will well, apparently, John, to that. Apparently you didn't have the Ghostbusters firehouse play set. Ooh, I did not. Know, you would know how everything was laid out. Ooh, somebody has money, had money. No, I actually it. didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh you, you just admired it from afar. Yeah, one of my one of my friends did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, some, and, somebody. Were, your friend. were you friends with him only because of that play set? No, he had that and the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. In oh. oh, well, that's enough to base a friendship yeah, on. I mean, sure. what, do you, what more do you need? Yes. Yeah. Friends for yeah. life. And if, if he also had like a Millennium Falcon yeah, oh, place, he, oh, yes, I mean, come on. He had everything. It all. He had it all. <sighs> yeah. Nice. You, you nice. never you never forget that one friend that had all the toys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. had actually stuff in boxes that he hadn't even taken out yet. He <sighs> had, I think, I want to say it was an X-Wing in a box. Ooh. And it was just like he had so much. But but I mean, I'm sh- I, I actually hope he kept it and he still has it in a box somewhere because that's worth thousands yeah. of dollars. But be good for him. But I remember as a little kid. He was, I mean, his family was loaded, 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 loaded. And it was my first time where I suddenly became aware of like money and par- and finances and that like, oh, parents have different money. Like mm-hmm. his, his parents have things that my parents don't. And, and I, I remember I was thinking about it on the drive home, like, and I kept wanting to ask my mom, but I knew I must've been like nine. And I knew that it was a question that you shouldn't ask. Yeah. And I, but I was like, how do I find out? Why he has so much stuff and I don't. Are we poor? <laughs> hey, mom, can I see your pay stubs? Yeah. <laughs> Let me see a W two real quick. <laughs> yeah, I remember this was at one point when I was older. I was I was over at a coworker's house or like his his family's house, and uh, it was a very nice house. And there was like some nice art on the walls and stuff. And and it was like his his father was a dentist, as I recall. And I was like, oh. Yeah, some people like make serious money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis is one of those occupations, I guess. And yeah. you know, considering what Dennis charge, I, it it shouldn't be too so surprising. I suppose. also the the highest suicide rate. Oh wow! Really? Yeah. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> what? Okay, I, like with air traffic controllers, I get it, but Dennis? Yeah, I I remember reading an article about it once, and I has I can't remember what it relates to, but. Uh, yeah, they say that uh, among I think medical professionals. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, well, uh, I wonder why that is. Is it just the monotony, or if I see one more dead tooth, I swear to God, I'm I'm gonna Google dentist and depression. I just I just did. Statistics here. put the suicide rate of dentists at three times higher than other white collar workers. Wow. What the hell, man? Yeah. Dennis, what what's going on? Yeah. Dentists hold the highest suicide rate at seven seven point one eight percent. Wow, wow, this episode just took a dark turn. It really did. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I mean, maybe the Ghostbusters can, you know, go find the ghosts of suicidal yes, exactly. dentists. And That's and there and there we just made a better movie than what we just saw. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, well, okay. Well, that's a question. Would Would you guys like to see another movie in this series, or should they just leave well enough alone? Do you think, think there's more life left in this? <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, I don't think we have a choice. I think it's coming, whether we like it or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this one made money, so uh, that almost guarantees we're getting another one. But I, I, I don't know. Like, as someone who is who does love the franchise, you know, almost as much as you do, Kevin. Like, I was kind of kind of hemming and hawing about going to see this this, this movie. I was like, ah, uh, like because I when I saw the trailer, I thought it looked fun enough, but it didn't get me super jazzed to see it. Yeah. And then after I, I watched it and it came out, I was like, all right, it was, that was okay, I guess. It was, eh, it didn't have the same magic, but even, I mean, I, I'm not expecting it to have the same magic as the first one, but just, yeah. just as a standalone movie on its own, I thought it was just kind of ho-hum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a friend of mine asked me what I thought on the day I, I came out of this, and I just, I just wrote, Bustin makes me feel Okay. And, and that really sums it up for me. I was like, you know, it was fine. Uh, I, I enjoyed it more than I didn't. Uh, and, you know, it pushed a few nostalgia buttons. Yeah. I, I wish I wish they'd gotten a little more creative with the new stuff. And I wish it had m- some more memorable gags. I, um, y- yeah. I think that's my takeaway from it. They, they were kind of, they kind of treated for kid gloves. Like they didn't really mm-hmm. take any big, you know, they didn't really innovate it as much and they didn't take any really big steps forward or do anything really yeah. like anything to sort of push forward this, uh, this I mean, IP. At, at, at the climax, I, I really you know, like, that's where I really felt like we have way too many characters here. Cause we've got like, you know, the, we've got the, the three original Ghostbusters. We've got Janine suited up as a, as a Ghostbuster, which was, you know, neat to see. And it was neat to see like Bill Murray bust her chops yeah. about that. Um, you know, he's like Janine in a Ghostbusters uniform. Where did she, but where did she get the name tag so quickly? I don't know. Yeah, because that, that's another thing. Cause, like, they have they a could, machine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They have a they have a so they have a so uh, Taylor on, yeah. on, uh, on retainer. Look, if 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 we if we have ghost but if we have ghost imprisoning technology, I'll grant them like a, uh, some sort of label maker. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, like that's another thing. Like, so does Janine work for Winston or like what is? Or I she, guess she does at this point. Yeah, they never made that clear. Like she just. But, but but anyway, we've got all the old people there, and then we've got, or I should say, the original people. I don't want to call them old people. And then we've got the the new Ghostbusters team there. So that's like eight characters right there. And then we also have Kumail Nanjiani in there too, doing his his you uh, know fire controlling yes. his, his, his his he's the what, what, he's the fire master. They call the him. fire master. Yeah, which sounds a lot like gate key master. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and I was, so it's like nine people in there and I was just like, that's just way too many. Cause I, I don't fear for the good guys as much when they're not outnumbered, you know, like at the climax of the original Ghostbusters, it's just those four. And those are all that's standing between us and the apocalypse basically. Yeah. And, you know, here we've got four people and we might've had podcast and lucky in there too. I don't, I don't even remember at this point, but yeah. I mean, it was so many, it was just like, yeah, we really need to pare this down somehow. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I just, there's just not, there's not a character that I care enough about. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, because when you have that many characters, you can't really develop them enough. Right, exactly. And 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 going back to the, and I, I, I don't want to beat this horse to death, but going back to their decision not to lean fully into the, the gay storyline, it felt mm-hmm. like they were they had the opportunity to give us an angle of a character that's much deeper than we have from any of the other characters, yeah. and they just didn't. And it was almost like, I almost was like, ah, oh, well then what? Like we don't like that. They're, they're all of these characters are just cookie cutter, yeah, just two dimensional. Like we they gave us like nothing to really like g- grab into and say, oh, this is a character I can I can care about. This yeah, like somebody. it felt like they were kind of afraid to take that risk because maybe they were afraid of. You know, people like, oh, the Ghostbusters are woke and blah. Like, but if yeah. you walk, if you, if, if, look, the three of us are relatively intelligent adults. Um, and we all walked out with the same impression that that was supposed to be a, 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 a you know, a gay relationship. Yeah. Everybody walked out with that. And the, yeah. ang- the people who were going to be angry about it were angry about it anyway. So, so true. go all the way. Just, just do it and don't be cowardly. And, I mean, and, and, and do something like all- good for the character. 
just just have them like holding hands a little more have them do like a kiss and you know the the ghost one fades away mid kiss or something that could that yeah could where she was from wasn't sweet, wasn't her touching. wasn't the ghost wasn't she from like the 70s or something like that i don't or, or I think the, at some point she died in a house fire yeah I, I feel I like recall. I feel like it was supposed to be a while ago. She could have said like, "Oh, yeah. you know, I would have like back in my day, this wouldn't have been allowed," or like, "I wouldn't have been." You yeah, know, something yeah. like something just to like. And I thought that's really where it was going to go because it was so obvious. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then it just and then it, like there was it was just like all the other storylines. It was just like uh, there was too much jammed into the movie that we you know we couldn't explore this yeah. all the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what did you think? Like they even introduced a couple more characters with Winston's crew at the at the new facility that he had. Terrible. And <laughs> and you know we, there was that one guy, and I think like uh, I think Kevin, you made the analogy earlier that they were like Star Trek red shirts. Yeah, and thought they were going to be killed off at some point. Oh, you're talking about uh, Lars Pinfield playing by uh, James uh, Acaster or the blonde uh, sure, guy? Sure, sure. Blonde guy. <laughs> yeah, blonde guy. Blonde yeah. guy who looks a little like cartoon Egon. Yes. Sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I was just kind of like, why is this guy here? Do we need another character? Uh, no, they could have. They could have combined. They could have just happening. had Janine working there, right? Or something. Exactly. They could have combined everything happening in the firehouse with everything happening in the secret lab, and. Mm-hmm. That would have been an interesting thing that like, oh, the Ghostbusters now, you know, they've they're now they're delving into like understanding ghosts better and finding mm-hmm. a new way to trap ghosts or whatever. Like that would make sense. I mean, and hell also, you know, if Winston has this big high tech facility that's, you know, advancing Ghostbuster technology, why the hell isn't Ray working there? He'd rather right. run the occult shop. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, and he even says I mean, at that, the end, like, I love this stuff or something like that. Like, he there, acknowledges there's a that nice it's scene in between blood. Ray and Winston towards the end where they they talk about like, hey, are we getting too old for this shit? And, you know, and, and that was really nice. That like, was, Yeah, that was a nice little Ac- Ackroyd and Ernie Hudson have a nice chemistry together. Yeah. They yeah. play off each yeah. other well. See, I thought that was like a nice little character building thing where we, yeah, like you said, like we learn Ray. Like the like, I think they mentioned like, oh, these are like our golden years. We're supposed to be winding down from all this shit. Yeah. But like Ray yeah. is like, no, this is all I want to do. Like, I don't want to go. Well, wasn't it? Wasn't it Ray and Winston at the beginning of the second movie that they go to the kids' party? Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. it to them? Yep. So they yeah. do. So you feel like they do, and they're also the two grateful yuppie larva. Yep. <laughs> and they're also the yeah. two in the in Ecto One at in the second movie com- in the first movie coming back, yeah. and they have the biblical discussion. So you feel yeah. like there is some kind of relationship there. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, hey guys, I don't want to have to cut this off, but my kid is up from her nap, and I have to go. Okay, to all right, let's let's wrap, okay. let's wrap it up. All right, well, I mean, do you have any final thoughts? Um, uh, I thought the well, real quick, yeah, oh, those little tiny uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Mans they keep showing throughout the movie. Why were they there? I didn't get that. I don't know. They're, they're, they're trying to make it a thing, like a little like gremlins, yeah. like trying to sell some toys. It's like, like in the first one, there was a bit of a reason for them to be around, but in this one, no, I didn't get any reason why we had the little miniature Stay Puft Marshmallow yeah. again, other than nostalgia. Yeah, but, and that, and then, then the post credit scene with them just stealing a Stay Puft truck, I was like, well, that's kind of pointless. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, overall, this movie was just meh. Yeah, I I thought it was okay. Like I did, I didn't walk out of the theater angry or anything. And I didn't feel like I'd wasted my money, but it wasn't everything I'd want a Ghostbusters movie to be. Yeah. But you know, what what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, uh, Kevin, any final thoughts? I think we need to put the Ghostbuster franchise to bed for five to ten years and revisit it again in a new universe. Okay. You might be right. So might we hear be. you loud and clear. Female Ghostbusters need to come back. Yes, do that's it. what we need. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth, one more time. <laughs> he was very funny in that movie. I will, I will, I will give him that. I feel like the next, probably what they're going to do next is they are going to do some sort of multiverse crossover thing between the original Ghostbusters, this current Ghostbusters team, and then the female team. Let's. Uh. let's uh, <laughs> don't even. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying it's probably what they're going to do. Don't put that into the ether. Don't you put that juju <laughs> out there, Ricky Bobby? Exactly. Because they even they even had that teaser at the end where she's like, "Hey guys, who's Zool?" And then, ha ha ha, yeah. <laughs> and we'll never know. We'll never yeah. know. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, yeah, that's our episode, guys. Thanks for listening, uh, Kevin Israel. Thanks again, as always, for offering your your insight and your your passion. For thanks. all things Ghostbusters, anything thanks you so want to, anything you want to plug, anything you want to promote, uh, floor's yours. 
No, you can check me out at kevinisrael.com for my comedy dates. I have a lot of stuff coming up in uh, in May, June, and July. So come on out to a show. All right. Yeah, he's a very funny guy. So check him out. And, uh, yeah, we will be back, uh, you know, with our regular episodes, talking about new episodes of SNL. And we'll be doing some more of these bonus episodes as we go for, for our Patreon subscribers. And if you want to contribute to our Patreon, you can go over to non-productive.com and just in, and just give us whatever you can af- comfortably afford. Mm. And, uh, you know, just indicate that you're doing it for the SNL nerds because you like what we do. Yes, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help out some SNL nerds. <laughs> that's right you can also follow us on the socials uh we're on twitter as we refuse to call it x at uh snl nerds show and uh you can also follow our individual twitter pages i'm at trumbull comic t-r-u-m-b-u-l-l in the word comic i'm at dare incredible d-a-r-i-n incredible uh kevin uh where, where can folks find you again kevin israel underscore nj nice okay so Well, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, we will be back with more fun SNL-related stuff. But until then... Nerds Nerds out! This has been a non-productive media presentation. Executive producer, Frank Hablaoui. This program and many others like it on the Non-Productive Network is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Please share it, but ask before trying to change it or sell it. For more information, visit non-productive.com.